We have a unique nation, a republic, like no others. And so this must be unique. This will be our nation's capital. Clearly, a lot of the designers and architects of Washington, D.C. were Masons, starting with George Washington himself, who was a guiding force. I do not believe that there are any secret plans or designs related to Freemasonry. Well, it was definitely designed according to Masonic principles. The streets are laid out that way. The buildings are laid out that way. Conspiracists are always looking under their bed for evidence that there is some vast conspiracy. And Masons may very well say that they really aren't influential as far as Washington, D.C. is concerned, and yet the cornerstone was laid by Masons. You see that the inverted five-pointed star, which is the goat of Mindy's, built into the streets of Washington, D.C. No, there are no satanic plans in the street plans of Washington, D.C. There is a pentagram to the north of the White House. But the streets don't actually connect to form a pentagram. This is geometry. It happens. No one could have that happen accidentally. The anti-Masons want to show that there is some demonic conspiracy. It's Baal worship. That's what you're involved in. That is what Masonry is based upon, the power of the dragon. In a word, hogwash. When you want to talk about symbols and what they mean, you really have to look at who's authored these symbols. With symbols, there are always multiple levels. Symbols reveal and they conceal. And that's why they're used and that's why they're so important. They reveal to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And if I would have told you this 15 years ago, I might have gotten shot. When they're shooting at you, you know they're serious. Absolutely, no well, way we can compromise. Throw the entire thing out. Oh, happily. Dude, this area I here, beg your pardon. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. Absolutely You're absolutely right. right. You have had Goodbye. Enough. Thank you. From its beginning, the design for Washington, D.C. has been a source of conflict and heated debate. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, a temperamental French architect, a famous African-American, and a mysterious surveyor, what set in motion a project that would span the next 150 years, with no end of controversy in sight. But beyond debates at an internal level, the very layout of the city is continually under suspicion. Arcane symbols and mythological designs, both inside and outside government buildings, have caused many to wonder if the city somehow represents a hidden agenda. This becomes increasingly important as America's current place on the world stage ignites firestorms of controversy. As the United States is the most powerful nation on earth, many have wondered, what is America up to? Could the purpose of operations currently carried out by the U.S. government somehow be reflected in the design of its capital city? At the center of controversy are secret societies. Many of America's leaders have belonged to them right from the nation's beginning. Our current president, George W. Bush, has admitted to his membership in the mysterious Skull and Bones Society. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. 
It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> right. Skull and Bones has to be the most powerful, one of the darkest of all secret societies that exists on this planet. It is about greed and it is about power. The idea for Skull and Bones is said to have come out of Germany in the early part of the 19th century. The society was founded at Yale University by William Huntington Russell, along with Attorney General and Secretary of War Alfonso Taft, whose son, William Howard Taft, would go on to become America's 27th president. Some believe the society's foundation demonstrates a clear link with what may be the oldest society of all, Freemasonry. The society is shown here in 1993, reenacting the laying of the cornerstone for the United States Capitol on the 200th anniversary of the event. Know all of you who hear me, we proclaim ourselves free and lawful Masons, true to the laws of our country, professing to revere God and to confer benefits upon mankind. This is the ceremony in which Senator Strom Thurmond, himself a 33rd degree Mason, took part. Senator Thurmond, we would like you to join in this. Since the William Morgan incident in 1826, when Americans uncovered a secret cabal working inside the government, the presence of masonry in places of power has always sparked debate. But their influence in American government is undeniable. This is the same Bible upon which Presidents Clinton, Bush, Carter, and George Washington were inaugurated president. Of America's 43 presidents, at least 15 are confirmed Masons, though some say the number is even greater. In addition to the Capitol, the Freemasons have laid the cornerstone for every major building in Washington, D.C. The cornerstones of the President's House, known to us as the White House, the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, incidentally by past Grand Master Benjamin Franklin, and Constitution Hall stand out among many others as outstanding examples of cornerstones which have been laid Masonically. The cornerstone of the United States Capitol, however, stands out above all buildings erected in the free world as the seat of government for our people. This bronze plaque, located inside the U.S. Capitol, marks the spot where the original cornerstone was laid by George Washington, the first American president and a Freemason. George Washington is probably the most famous Mason in the world. The George Washington Masonic Memorial is entirely dedicated to the idea of Washington as a Freemason. Now, we do know that uh, Washington uh, participated in the laying of the cornerstone of the United States Capitol as a Masonic ceremony, and he wore his regalia as a Master Mason. And he laid the cornerstone and performed the ceremony of laying the cornerstone. Washington's participation in the event was recorded by the newspaper of the time, the Columbian Mirror, which can still be obtained through the Library of Congress. Laying the cornerstones of buildings which serve mankind is one of the world's most ancient customs. The cornerstone laying ceremony predates Freemasonry, um, although its early s symbolic purposes uh, as, a, as a sacrifice to appease the gods uh, or, or demons or whatever uh, in prehistorical times, of course, has no application to why Freemasons do it. The corn, wine, and oil that we, uh, that we use for this are, are also ancient symbols. Corn is the symbol of plenty. Wine, the symbol of refreshment, and oil, the symbol of joy and gladness. While Masonry maintains these symbols as a representation of blessing, there are some who believe they hold a more hidden meaning. 
With symbols, there are always multiple levels, up to seven different levels of interpretation with every particular symbol. Corn is an important symbol in masonry and is one found repeatedly in Washington, D.C. But what sort of hidden meaning could apply to corn? In Hebrew, the word for corn is Dagan, which became the name of a Babylonian god. Some believe the same god was adopted by the Phoenicians under the name Dagon. While Dagon was often worshipped as the fish god, he was also the god of corn. His son was known as Baal, who was often called the son of Dagan or the son of corn. Now corn, of course, if we're talking about um, pre-New World times, would, would be any grain or wheat. To complicate matters further, in the Old Testament, we find the children of Israel offering corn and wine and oil to Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Yet at some point, God's anger was kindled against them for turning the sacrifice into idolatry. In the book of Hosea, God says of Israel, she did not know that I gave her the corn and wine and oil, which they prepared for Baal. Notice again this Phoenician version of Baal, as a bearded man with strong features. Could Baal have been the model for the bearded male images that appear throughout Washington, D.C.? Take note of this image with ears of corn carved into the hair. According to legend, Baal was once slain by the god of death and taken into the underworld. But at some point, he was resurrected, or as it is sometimes called, awakened. At Haynes Point in Washington, D.C., is found this mysterious statue of a bearded giant rising up out of the ground or perhaps out from his grave. The statue is called the Awakening. According to the Masonic Encyclopedia, Another symbol for resurrection is the Egyptian obelisk, which is the shape of the Washington Monument. The word obelisk is sometimes translated Baal shaft or the shaft of Baal. As a result, critics of masonry argue that Baal, not Yahweh, is the real God to whom Masons perform their ceremony. It's not until you get to the Royal Arch degree that all of a sudden you realize uh, who God is or what the name of God is. It's hidden for a long time. In fact, you're told that there's this hidden word you're supposed to search for. But it's not until you finally get to that degree that you realize that uh, His name is revealed. It's believed that at the higher levels, the Masons secretly worship Baal under a hidden and unusual name. As you go higher up in the masonry, you learn the secret name of God, which is a, a secret and the, the lost word that the masons in the Blue Lodge see. They already know it. It's Jobulun. It's a combination of Jehovah, Baal, and Osiris. It's a deity that is not the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But nowhere in that Scottish Rite degree, and I have to stress that this is an additional degree, this is not a part of regular craft Freemasonry, nowhere in that additional degree, is there ever any suggestion that Jubilon is the name of a god? What it is, is a, is a amalgam of three different words, which in ancient languages was the word for god. Coyle's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, he admits on page 516 that Jebulon is basically a composite of three different names of different gods. Uh, Je, meaning Jehovah, or, or the Syriac name of God, as he says. And then uh, Baal, or he says Bel, B-E-L, or Baal, he spells it B-A-A-L, how the Bible spells Baal, or Baal, it's pronounced in Hebrew, uh, which is the Canaanite god. And then he gives on for the Egyptian god, referencing uh, many Masons reference Osiris. 
And it's interesting because when you look at what he's said there, he's admitting that the Masonic name for God includes Baal or Baal. It's not intended to represent a god. Its only use in the ritual is as a password to gain entry to the, to the lodge. It's a demonic god. It's Baal worship. That's what you're involved in. It is the word for God in three ancient languages, three ancient civilizations. And that's all it is. The Mason is actually worshiping Baal, Jebulon, Je on and Osiris and just using the name of Jehovah, which is also wrong because God warns not to use his name in vain. Freemasonry is often attacked uh, and accused of being a religion simply because it promotes a belief in God. But nowhere in the teachings of Freemasonry does it promote any specific attributes of God. See, belief in God is faith. Belief about God is religion. From a, a biblical Christian standpoint, and as a Christian, I have to really take issue with this because there are many scriptures from, from Genesis to Revelation that condemn idolatry and worshiping other gods. In Freemasonry, to make it easy for men of all faiths to meet together, we use the expression great architect of the universe. Now that's not a name, that's a description. Uh, much the same as grand geometrician is a description. Um, of, uh, of an attribute of, of God. Grand geometrician or great architect refers to his attribute as the great creator. But men of all faiths can accept that description of their God. God warns about an admixture or a synergism or a synchronistic view of mixing different gods with his name. And that's something he's very clear about that we're, we're not to do. In fact, it's interesting, Baal, or Baal, is depicted uh, in the New Testament by the Jews as well as Jesus. He's called the ruler of demons. It's another name for Satan. Most scholars agree that Baal became synonymous with the devil. Yet Masonry insists its view of God is without definition. For the Mason, the corn, wine, and oil ceremony might as easily be dedicated to Baal as to any other god. Nevertheless, the conflict between Masonry and its critics goes on. Freemasonry is rationalist and humanist. It is not superstitious and it is not involved in the occult. A lot of Masons don't have a clue as to the fact that, that the Masonic God is basically Satan. I think that's supremely arrogant of anyone who's not a Mason to believe they know more about Freemasonry than a Mason does. May corn, wine, and oil and all the necessaries of life abound among the people of the world. And may this building be continued and preserved to the latest ages. What do these things really signify? Could it be an occult ceremony representing some sort of demonic conspiracy, as some suggest? Or is it merely a harmless practice to honor an ancient tradition? To investigate these things, we first review the beliefs of the secret societies that came to America. It is clear that the arcane symbolism in Washington, D.C. begins with them. When you want to talk about symbols and what they mean, you really have to look at who's authored these symbols, what, what was their intentions. Well, I think it's obvious that anybody who has the eyes to see can see that, that Washington, D.C. and indeed many other state capitals are festooned with occult symbols. Because these symbols come from the esoteric realm, it is important to define them according to the thinking of occult philosophers. Symbols reveal and they conceal. And that's why they're used and that's why they're so important. They reveal to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And they, they conceal from those who do not have the eyes to see or ears to hear. In the book, Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated, we find this quote from Masonic author Charles G. Berger, who says that symbols came to have two meanings, the esoteric and the exoteric. The esoteric meaning was the true or original meaning, understood only by a few and closely guarded by them. The exoteric meaning was the invented or modified explanation intended for the many. 
This practice dates back to ancient Egypt and is explained by Dr. Robert Hieronymus, a member of a secret society called Co-Masonry and author of the book, Founding Fathers, Secret Societies. As with all secret societies, you have levels, and, and if you're on the lower levels, you don't even know their upper levels. You don't even, you don't even, they don't even tell you. You bump into it by accident or someone comes along. Now, in Scottish Rite, that's something different, you know, because they know that there's a... But before then, and basically secret societies, such as, let's go to ancient Egypt. To the ancient Egyptians, the priest would tell the serfs, the guys that tilled the land, they would say, the sun is God, okay? And, and, and so the, they accepted that very um, low-level interpretation, all physical. That's not what the priests believed. What the priests believed, there was a second level. Um, the priests believed that, no, nope, the physical sun is not the supreme being. It's the spirit which flows through the physical sun that is the supreme deity. However, there was another level. And the priests didn't even know it. It's those that were involved and, and, and elevated to, to um, if I would have told you this 15 years ago, I might have gotten shot. But this is now, I'm so glad now that this is easy to talk about. Um, the, the third level, which was, the, which was a better, a higher level of understanding, said, nope, it's not, that's not the sun. The sun is not the supreme deity. Nope, yes, spiritual energies come through the sun. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the star serious? The dog star. The dog star, because the dog star was everything to the ancient Egyptians. Sirius is said to have been the most important star in the ancient world. It was considered the brightest star in the heavens, many times brighter than the sun. The Great Pyramid was built to synchronize with Sirius so that the light of the star would shine into the queen's chamber, supposedly to cast a beam upon an initiate during a ritual. Sirius is considered to be the, the dog star. It's considered to be the most evil star in the Egyptian pantheon. And the reason for this is because in ancient Egypt, they depended on the Nile. And during the time when Sirius is in its ascendancy, which is in late July and early August, was the, was the time of drought. It was a time when the Nile was at its most, uh, its most weak in terms of being able to be used for crops. And so the Egyptians thought this is a time of blasted, blight, drought, and evil. It seems strange then that Sirius should be related to the founding of America. According to Masonic author David Ovison, the Declaration of Independence was signed when the sun was in alignment with Sirius in July of 1776. It is, however, appropriate that Sirius should be related to the most Egyptian-styled icon in America's capital city the Washington Monument. Oveson writes that in 1848, when the cornerstone of the Washington Monument was laid, the sun would have passed over Sirius. He goes on to say that in the course of the ceremonial, the star of Sirius would have been seen on the eastern horizon. It would have been rising over the Capitol building to the east of the monument. The monument itself was originally designed by Freemason architect Robert Mills. Mills was trained by two fellow Masons, James Hoban, who designed the White House, and Benjamin Latrobe, who designed the U.S. Capitol. Mills' original design seemed to combine the whole pantheon of pagan mysteries, an Egyptian-style obelisk surrounded by a Roman colonnade with Greco-Roman-looking statues all around it. According to the original plan, the monument should have been built directly south of the White House. But as with every plan, things change. When they went to build it, and when they calculated what the weight of the monument was going to be, they determined that that precise spot, that the foundations and the bedrock at that precise location 
would not safely support the weight of the monument. As a result, the monument was shifted slightly to the east. While it is not in a perfect alignment with the White House, it would end up in a perfect north-south alignment with the Masonic House of the Temple, which was built some years later. The construction for the Washington Monument began on July 4, 1848, with the laying of the monument's cornerstone by Freemasonic President James K. Polk. The project itself would take over 30 years to complete, during which time funding for the project would be scarce, the American Civil War would take place, and many ideas about the monument would develop. When the aluminum capstone was finally set on December 6, 1884, the end result would be a much simpler and more Egyptian figure than was first envisioned. The shift in design was the influence of George Perkins Marsh, the man considered the father of the modern environmentalist movement. In 1876, Marsh was the U.S. Minister to Italy. While there, he spent years studying the many obelisks which had been brought from Egypt. It was he who realized that the height of a traditional Egyptian obelisk was approximately ten times the base, causing the plan for the Washington Monument to be reduced from 600 feet to 555 feet. As for the colonnade and statues planned by Mills, Marsh wrote, throw out all the gingerbread of the Mills design and keep only the obelisk. While a true obelisk is fashioned from a single block of stone, the Washington Monument is made up of many stones. The hope of the Washington Monument Society was that the structure would reflect the idea of out of many, one. Meanwhile, the Pyramidion at the top is made up of 13 levels, just like that of the pyramid on the Great Seal of the Dollar Bill. But mysteries abound with the monument, not the least of which is the presence of a 12-foot obelisk beneath a manhole just a few hundred feet away from the Washington Monument. It appears to be a miniature replica of the monument itself, but as to why it is there, no one seems to know. Yet like the pyramid on the U.S. dollar, this obelisk is missing a capstone. Meanwhile, Masonic author David Ovison is convinced that the Freemasons who signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th and who laid the cornerstone for the Washington Monument on that same date would have been familiar with the rising of the Egyptian dog star Sirius as it is an important symbol in Freemasonry. Interesting thing about all Freemasonry is that symbolism is ultimately very important. They don't put a lodge in the east because it's a nice place and it looks good. They put it in lodge in the east. The masters have put it in the east so because it's the rising sun. It's the rising sun. You're catching the energies of the light. As Dr. Hieronymus revealed earlier, the real light shining in the east for the Egyptians was not merely the sun, but the light of the dog star Sirius, which some believe holds a more sinister implication. This this dog star also has relations to the idea of modern-day ceremonial magic and modern-day masonry. This was especially true for 20th century occultist and Freemason, Aleister Crowley, who openly practiced ceremonial magic and was a member of a secret order called the Order of the Silver Star. The Silver Star was a reference to Sirius. Masons teach that at the center of every Masonic Lodge, there's a five-pointed star right underneath the altar upon which the candidate is obligated. But the thing is, what they don't tell you is that five-pointed star represents Sirius, which is regarded as a satanic symbol. There is perhaps no symbol that evokes occult suspicion like the figure of the pentagram, which from ancient times was associated with the dog star Sirius. Masonic philosopher Albert Pike wrote that Sirius still glitters in our lodges as the blazing star. 
The blazing star is an ancient Gnostic term for Sirius, and as shown here, is symbolized in Freemasonry by the five-pointed star or pentagram. According to Pike, this symbol in Masonry dates back to the pentalpha of the Greek philosopher Pythagoras. The pentalpha gets its name for the five alphas or Greek letter A's which make up its composition. Typically in Freemasonry, you see the five-pointed star with the nose point down. Now, there are even, there's even a division in Masonry which considers this the evil side of Freemasonry as opposed to the non-evil side. For example, Freemasonic lodges in New York do not use the nose side down uh, star. They turn it around so the nose is pointing up and they consider that uh, a good variety of Freemasonry. Here is an upright Masonic star, which is another type of the blazing star mentioned earlier. Some believe this representation of Sirius may be the origin of the five-pointed stars which adorn the American flag, as well as the stars that adorn the Statue of Freedom on top of the U.S. Capitol. Incredibly, these same five-pointed stars were carved by Freemasons into the ceiling of Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland more than 500 years ago. Because Sirius is said to arise in the east, it also became known as the Eastern Star. To the Egyptians, Sirius was identified with the dog god Anubis, which is where the name Dog Star comes from. Anubis was said to have guarded the gates of death and was the protector of mysteries. Meanwhile, the Romans recognized Sirius as Janitor Lathaeus, or the Keeper of Hell. These dark associations may be the reason for the sometimes grim view of Sirius and the five-pointed star that represents it. But Sirius was also associated with the Egyptian goddess Isis, and here, as we connect the dots, a more complete picture begins to emerge. For the Egyptians, the rising of Sirius in the east preceded the annual flooding of the Nile River, which for them was a magical event. It was also the time that the goddess Isis would appear and give birth to Horus, the divine child of the Egyptian trinity. The all-seeing eye is also called the Eye of Horus, and in Freemasonry, Horus symbolizes the Masonic concept of a Christ. This is further represented by the hieroglyph used to denote Sirius. Notice the three symbols, an obelisk, a star, and a half circle. According to Egyptologists, the half circle is used to denote what is called the benben, or the capstone used atop the pyramids. Throughout all history, it has been said that the capstone to the Great Pyramid of Egypt has been missing, which is why the all-seeing eye of Horus floats in its place above the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. According to occult philosophers, the light which illuminates the eye comes not from the sun, but from the dog star Sirius, as is demonstrated by this illustration of the blazing star of masonry centered by an all-seeing eye. As Robert Balville writes, in many esoteric traditions, the return of the capstone of the Great Pyramid will signal the return of the Great Initiate, which, according to many prophecies, signifies the return of the Christ. Albert Pike describes the Masonic Trinity as expressed through Sirius and the symbols that are seen in most all Masonic halls. Notice this image with the sun on one side and the moon on the other, while the all-seeing eye sits in between with light blazing behind it. Pike writes that the sun and moon represent the two grand principles, the male and the female. Both shed their light upon their offspring, the blazing star or Horus.
These philosophies have been known and practiced by secret societies for many centuries. As the evidence will show, designing cities as a reflection of a cult tradition was not a new concept to the Founding Fathers, among whom the influence of Freemasonry seems undeniable. In fact, the 110th Congress of the United States on January 5th, 2007 passed House Resolution Number 33 to honor the Freemasons for their contribution throughout America's history. The number 33 is well known as the honorary degree of Scottish Rite Masonry. The House Resolution read in part that the founding fathers of this great nation and signers of the Constitution, most of whom were Freemasons. The Masons felt in the United States that they were forming a Masonic Republic. The concept of a Republic dates back to the Greek philosopher Plato. Plato's a Republic. That's a utopian theme, and that whole thing runs through our philosophy and thinking among the humanists to this day. They still think they would like to introduce uh, Plato's uh, Republic. Think about it. Every socialist uh, country that has gone socialist have always called themselves a republic for that very reason. It was Plato who likewise set down the earliest known record of ancient Atlantis. Centuries later, Sir Francis Bacon would set down the new Atlantis, a tale which some believe was meant to be a blueprint for the new world, one based upon the teachings of ancient philosophers. Bacon didn't invent this new Atlantis concept. He was merely the inheritor of it. He was probably the most articulate proponent of it ever in history, but uh, it preceded him. Bacon believed that the American continent was in fact the site of ancient Atlantis, a concept held by teachers of esoteric wisdom even today. A new Atlantis really was just America anyway. The east coast of America, if you take a look at the maps uh, by other clairvoyants who have studied Atlantis, indicates that the east coast of America was the west coast of Atlantis. This country, America, is the remnant of the ancient Atlantis. And so is very susceptible to much of the, of the history of Atlantis, the, the energies of Atlantis, and some of the, the actions, for instance, the religion of Atlantis. According to esoterics, the religion of Atlantis was in fact the mystery school teachings that were embraced by the ancient philosophers. Yet it might be said that none have been as prolific on this subject as 20th century philosopher Manley P. Hall, who wrote such books as The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny. It was Hall that many Freemasons are said to have called Masonry's greatest philosopher. In 1934, Hall founded the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, California, an organization dedicated to exploring the wisdom of all the world's traditions. It began in 1934, and I think in this building, the library itself was uh, finished in 1936. This is uh, one of the leading wisdom libraries in all of North America, if not, if not the most comprehensive itself. The Philosophical Research Library has been highly regarded by esoteric students from all over the world. It is composed of books and artifacts collected by Manley Hall throughout his lifetime. Among those who revered the library was President Franklin D. Roosevelt, a Freemason and student of esoteric tradition. And Mr. Roosevelt himself, you know, back in 1942, after the Pearl Harbor invasion, sent some of his people here to, to microfiche uh, the works of the, in this library because he looked upon it as a national treasure. He wanted to preserve it. When Hall died in 1990, his role as president of the society was succeeded by Dr. Obadiah Harris. Manley Hall, who was a young 
Canadian philosopher, sage type, envisioned um, re-establishing what he called um, the little Alexandrian library, which was, as you know, destroyed. Um, he was very fortunate in that as he was giving a talk, he was still in his, only, in his early 20s, a baroness, oil baroness, from uh, Ventura, who owned most of the oil wells in Ventura County, told him that she was going to take care of him for the rest of his life, that no matter what he needed to let her know, that she would see that he got it. And that she wasn't really joking, because I've looked at the records and back in the uh, early 30s, when most of the country was in depression, I don't know if California was really in one, but most of the world, the country was, she was giving him 50000 and and $100,000 at a time to go around and search out these, this wisdom literature in manuscript form and in book form. This proves interesting because much of Hall's highly financed research was dedicated to investigating the founding and purpose of America. Through his research, Hall became convinced that America had a secret destiny that was known by the arcane societies of the ancient world. Was it this information that compelled FDR to preserve Hall's literature? Like Hall, FDR also believed that America had a rendezvous with destiny. Hall's connections to the White House and FDR are mysterious, but do not end with the library. Hall was also involved with a mysterious Russian mystic named Nicholas Rorick. Rorick was a Rosicrucian and member of the Theosophical Society. He was said to be a kind of spiritual mentor to Henry Wallace, a 32nd degree Mason who would become FDR's vice president. It was Rorick's influence that inspired Wallace and ultimately FDR to place the great seal of the United States on the back of the dollar bill with the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages. Tell us about this, uh, this statue here. Oh well, earlier. this would this this would be a this would be a very favorite thing to to Manny Hall. This is Nicholas Rorick. Today, a statuette of Nicholas Rorick can be found at the PRS Library. Well, actually, he lived even in even the 20th century up until. What impact could the beliefs of men like Rorick and Manly P. Hall have had on the highest levels of America's government? They jumped a few decades from the New Deal because the, the, the Novus Ordum Seculorum can be translated to the New Deal in English as easily and readily as to the New Order or the New World Order. Um, I truly believe FDR believed that he was creating a New World Order uh, out of the Depression and that he had with him and, and had, you know, encircled himself by people who who would facilitate that dream these visions of, of new world order or new new world the, the world of democracy that's a part of the very soul that that gave birth to this country as the United States was born the design for its capital city would begin under the leadership of President George Washington who was himself a master mason. 150 years later, the fulfillment of its major construction with such buildings as the Jefferson Memorial, the National Archives, and the Pentagon would be completed under the leadership of another Masonic president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But was the city erected to represent the country's concept of liberty or to reflect an ancient belief in America's destiny? According to Hall, Freemasonry plays a pivotal role in bringing forth this ancient plan. Manly P. Hall was a, was a Freemason, wasn't he? Right, he was a 33rd degree Mason. He was really important as far as trying to figure out uh, what the goals of Freemasonry are in this age. He, he gives you 
hints, just incredibly important hints at what they're all about at the root level, what it is they're really striving for, what is their core inner doctrine, which they really don't like much revealing uh, to the rest of the world. According to Hall, one of the chief secrets of Masonry, handed down through the centuries, was the concept of democracy, which was said to be a threat to the kings and monarchs of the ancient world, who ruled by divine right. Yes, it had to be secret because the idea of democracy was, um, was worse than heresy. It was treason. Nevertheless, these societies were determined to bring forth their great plan, no matter what the cost. In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, Manley P. Hall wrote that world democracy was the secret dream of the great classical philosophers, saying that the brilliant plan of the ancients has survived to our time, and it will continue to function until the great work is accomplished. Many researchers believe this great work is the secret behind the wars and rumors of war America has been involved in through the 20th century, right up to the present day. Could this plan of the ancients to establish a world democracy be the real hidden agenda of secret societies? And was this ancient plan echoed in the 2005 inaugural address given by President Bush? When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. The occult is working at the highest levels of our society using the military and financial power of the United States to bring about this one world state. And the president has spoken openly about it, how the purpose of the United States is to bring democracy to the nations of the world. Where did this become the function of our nation to bring democracy to the world? You only need to read the writings of Mandy P. Hall where he tells you that for 3,000 years secret societies have been working to bring democracy to the world. You read President Bush's speech you know, uh, before the Association on Democracy, the National Association of Democracy. He tells you for 2,500 years people have been working to bring democracy to the world. Yet the ancient philosophers recognized that a true democracy could only be achieved by a society of perfected men. The perfected men would be comfortable in a true democracy. And probably a true democracy cannot emerge until there is enough of such human beings in the world that can take over the government of man. It will be that kind of leadership. It will be like Plato's vision of the philosopher king, the man who has wisdom, and the man who has power. Democracy has the occult promise of a fair world to live in. Now, you, you mentioned the, the occult promise. How would you define a term like that for an audience who's... Well, probably uh, define that term by saying that 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 promise okay, is, is explain it, the word occult. Well, it's obs it's know. obscure. It's it's uh, hidden. Can can you start by saying the occult? The word occult means the, the word occult would mean hidden, or obscure, um, not visible to the normal eye. So an occult promise is something that is inherent but only visible to those who have that inner vision. So a fair world is a kind of occult promise at the heart of democracy. Is that a, a better explanation? But is this occult promise part of America's Christian heritage? And if not, could this account for why the many symbols that adorn America's capital city come not from the Bible, but from the ancient mystery religion? And if America were really truly a Christian nation, what would all of these mythological uh, characters be in our city? Certainly the Christian influence was very strong. 
from the Christian point of view, we were formed as a Christian nation. But from the occultist point of view and those associated with astrology and the ancient mystery religions, America was, of course, to, and Washington, D.C. was to represent their position. So you've had the two forces, you know, in, in America ever since its formation. While it seems that most of America's leaders have upheld Christian ideals, their reason for doing so is often questioned. If they were Christians, why would they erect monuments to pagan gods and goddesses? And if they were pagans, why confess to Christian ideals? Manley Hall suggests the reason may have been one of self-preservation. He argues that because of the persecutions of organized religion in the old world, the secret societies employed even greater methods of secrecy to protect their occult philosophies, making themselves sound as though their beliefs had to do with Christianity, which was the dominant belief in Europe, and eventually America. He says, the pagan intellectuals reclothed their original ideas in a garment of Christian phraseology but bestowed the keys of the symbolism only upon those duly initiated and bound to secrecy. It is for this reason that all secret societies have an initiation process whereby members are bound by blood oaths not to reveal the secrets of the order. A chief factor that contributes to confusion about the beliefs of America's founders is the presence of Rosicrucianism the Rosicrucians are a mystical arcane society that played a major role in the development of Freemasonry. The rose and cross which symbolize the society are also the source of its confusion. The rose is the symbol of secrecy and represents the pagan mystery religions while the cross symbolizes Christianity. Rosicrucianism is when the two are combined. The Rosicrucians can write and speak about Jesus Christ, the cross, prayer, and the Bible. But with these things, they combine elements of magic and the mystical philosophies of the ancient world. Because of this, one can begin to understand how a man like Charles Thompson could be famous for his English translation of the Old and New Testaments and at the same time approved the design of the Great Seal for the United States with the all-seeing eye of Horus floating over an Egyptian pyramid. Thompson was closely associated with a man named Peter Miller, a well-known 18th century Rosicrucian and the leader of the Ephrata community in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. The Ephrata cloister is believed to have been the first esoteric settlement in the New World, with connections to some of the founding fathers such as Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. The early Ephrata movement clearly held mystical beliefs, even driving stakes into doorways to ward off evil spirits. We now know for a certain that they were Rosicrucians. It was Washington was close to these individuals, as well as Franklin and, Washington, uh, and, and Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin even enlisted the aid of Peter Miller to translate the Declaration of Independence into a number of European languages and to inform the world of America's independence. The printing for these translations was done at the Ephrata Cloister. Peter Miller would have been further connected to many of the founding fathers through the American Philosophical Society, founded originally by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society's members included such prominent figures as Thomas Paine, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, the Marquis de Lafayette, George Washington, Charles Thompson, and of course, Peter Miller. Later members would also include such names as Charles Darwin and Thomas Edison. Franklin Society is thought to be directly related to the earlier concepts set forth by Sir Francis Bacon. According to Michael Howard in his book, The Occult Conspiracy, Franklin's American Philosophical Society was operated in the same tradition as the Royal Society in England, which was based on Sir Francis Bacon's Rosicrucian concept of the Invisible College. In the history of the Royal Society, 
they refer to the beginnings of the Royal Society came from a group of people who called themselves the Invisible College. The Royal Society was brought in after Bacon's day. In fact, Bacon had been dead, I think, about 50 or 60 years, and the Royal Society, uh, Society was then brought in. How it happened, I believe, was... Well, in fact, it, it's, it's documented so solidly that you can buy... Um, um, there's a book written by Thomas Spratt, who was the first president of the Royal Society. So this goes back to the uh, early 1700s, and he wrote a history on it. And he acknowledged there that Francis Bacon was the originator of the idea. The purpose of the Royal Society of London was to further Bacon's advancement of learning through scientific investigation. It is without question, however, that some of their work led to the metaphysical and the occult. And then we find that the Rosicrucians called themselves the Invis Invisible Brotherhood, and the, the College of Rosicrucians was therefore what was called by them the Invisible College. A Rosicrucian influence can be clearly seen in some of America's symbols. For example, this image of a pelican feeding her young appears in Manley Hall's secret teachings of all ages and is very common to Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Now notice the great seal for the state of Louisiana. This particular replica is found inside the inner corridors of the U.S. Capitol. The Temple Church in London is a well-known Knight Templar church. Here we can see that the Golden Rosy Cross can be traced back to the mysterious knights. Now, notice the arts surrounding the shrine. How a series of squares are shown with red and golden roses in the midst. The shrine opposite has a variation of the same design. Now consider this same pattern as it appears throughout the interior of the state capitol. Inside the old Supreme Court room and in various forms throughout the Library of Congress. Sir Francis Bacon became the chief of the Rosicrucians in England. His famous saying, knowledge is power, is found written inside the Library of Congress, while a statue of Bacon can be seen on the upper level. Elsewhere in the main library is a Baconian passage from his collection of essays. It reads, the inquiry, knowledge, and belief of truth is the sovereign good of human nature. This saying is found over a statue representing philosophy. Could this be an indication that Baconian philosophy governs the New World concept? Bacon took his inspiration from the goddess Pallas Athena, known for her helmet of invisibility. Pallas Athena images also turn up throughout Washington, D.C. The Virginia State Seal bears the image of Athena with her foot upon a fallen king whose crown is cast aside. The word Six Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants, written beneath. To the Romans, Athena was called Minerva. This painting of Minerva can be found in the Great Hall of the Library of Congress. At 15 and a half feet high, it is the most imposing image in the room. Notice she holds a spear that comes like a ray of light from the sun with a traditional helmet of Athena at her feet. This particular work was done by 19th century artist Elihu Vedder. Vedder was known as a symbolist painter whose style was part of a movement that can be traced to France during the 19th century and an art house called the Salon de la Rose Croix. Yes, they were a group of Rosicrucian artists known for promoting symbolic and often bizarre imagery. Some of which, like the image of the satyr, seems to be repeated inside the Library of Congress. It's not clear if Vedder himself was a Rosicrucian, 
but one of his chief influences certainly was. William Butler Yeats was a prominent member of the Golden Dawn, a Rosicrucian secret society. Yeats, along with Irish mystic William Blake, are said to be two of Vedder's leading inspirations. Vedder's own occult themes are filled with haunting esoteric imagery, like this work, which is called The Cup of Death. In addition to Minerva, Vedder was commissioned to do a series of paintings illustrating government, which can be found at the east end of the Great Hall in the Library of Congress. Now let's look again at this image from the Salon de la Rose Croix. It pictures Leonardo da Vinci on the right, dressed like Joseph of Arimathea, whom occultists believe was the original cupbearer for the Holy Grail. Beside him is Dante Alighieri, dressed as a Knight Templar. By now, most people are familiar with da Vinci's arcane background thanks to Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Most are also familiar with Dante's Inferno, representing the many circles of hell. But according to Michael Howard, Dante was no ordinary writer. He was, in fact, a Rosicrucian Grand Master who wove Rosicrucian philosophies into his writings. Masonic philosopher Albert Pike wrote that it was Dante who first publicly expounded the symbol of the Rose Cross. Something partly seen in William Blake's sketch of Dante's Paradise, with a cross in the center. But now look at this drawing done by famed artist Gustave Doré. The title of Doré's illustration is, quote, the saintly throng in the form of a rose. This statue of Dante, holding a copy of his Divine Comedy, is found in Meridian Hill Park in Washington, D.C. This is the same park that is said to have marked the sacred 77th meridian upon which Washington, D.C. was built. But one final Rosicrucian emblem in the Library of Congress is worth noting. High up in the ceiling, in between two faunish looking figures with serpents for legs, is what appears to be a traditional crucifixion. But behind the Christ-like figure on the cross is a black, double-headed phoenix. The words in Latin that encircle the image come from Psalm 17.8 a psalm that is often employed in Rosicrucian writings. It reads, under the shadow of thy wings, protect us. The question is, whose wings are providing the protection? The Rosicrucians, like the Freemasons, follow a particular philosophy known as Hermeticism, which is directly related to how and why Washington, D.C. was built. The origin of this philosophy dates back to the deepest recesses of the ancient world and to what has been one of the most dominant subjects in archaeological and metaphysical research through the 19th and 20th centuries, the lost empire of Atlantis. In Plato's dialogue, the entire authority of the Atlantis tale is based on the reputation of Solon, the Greek poet and lawgiver. Plato cited Solon as his source of information concerning the Atlantis story. And Solon said that he got his information about the Atlanta story from the priesthood of ancient Egypt uh, during his time there, which was, was extensive. Um, he is featured prominently in the Hall of the Lawgivers in the Capitol building. And he is also featured prominently on the pediment on the back of 
the Supreme Court building. The pediment above the east entrance of the Supreme Court building features Moses holding the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. To his right is Confucius, the ancient Chinese philosopher, while on his left is the Athenian lawgiver, Solon. Solon, you know, was one of those seven wise men of Greece. Seemed to be very realistic about what he knew, which we knew where he got what he knew entirely, but he passed it on to Plato. So in, in the old Atlantis that was in, in legend, at least, although it seems like that, that, that Solon and, and Plato really believed it existed. Atlantis is significant to understanding the secret societies, as it is said that all the mysteries believed by them have their beginning in this ancient empire. Well, it's this concept that there, that there is ancient, mysterious, magical knowledge, uh, which we initiates only can provide to you, and goes back to the time of Atlantis. All knowledge, the power to heal, the power to destroy, godlike powers hidden within secret societies. The ancient mystery religion is said to have been carried in secret to preserve the teachings through the Dark Ages. It's believed the mysteries were adopted by the Knights Templar, who brought them back to Europe when they returned from the Crusades. The um, Templars came over to the Holy Land, and this is where the Templars got a lot of their kind of outre heretical ideas um, that, that later on got them in a lot of trouble. In England, the mysteries were adopted by men like Dr. John Dee, and later by Sir Francis Bacon. When Bacon sent his secret societies to the New World, the mysteries came with them. In short, the ancient mysteries represent the pagan beliefs of Rome, Greece, Babylon, and Egypt. And before that, it said to Enoch, who was the great initiate and king of Atlantis, um, and it said all the teachings come from Enoch. Enoch is mentioned in the book of Genesis, where it says that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The biblical Enoch was then adopted by the ancient occult philosophers who transformed him into a synthesis of various pagan gods and wise men. According to Masonic historians, Enoch was later known as Hermes to the Greeks and Mercury to the Romans. Among the Egyptians, he was called Toth, and the Book of Toth is said to be a collection of his wisdom. Enough cannot be said about the esoteric version of Enoch. When Dr. John Dee made contact with angelic beings, they supposedly communicated a system of magic to him based on the Book of Enoch. Today, this system is widely practiced and is known as Enochian magic. Yet it is Enoch's identity as Hermes that seems most prevalent in the mysteries. And hence the term Hermetic. And supposedly there was this great, awesome teacher of occult lore uh, who was known as Hermes Trismegistus, which means thrice greatest Hermes. And he, he produced this, this book that's called The Divine Poimander. And this is kind of like, if you will, a Bible of ancient occult lore. It was Hermes who was said to be the first to discover the zodiac and invented the art of communicating knowledge to the world. More importantly, Hermes taught men the craft of building cities. In the Divine Pymander is revealed the Hermetic Maxim, as above, so below, as pictured by this tarot card of a magician with one hand up and the other hand down. As above, so below, but after a different manner. And what that means is, is that in esoteric thought, in everything that is above is reflected down below. So for example, a human being is, is a certain shape and form, but the universe 
itself is a giant version of the human body. And that everything that is down here has a supernal macrocosmic, if you will, uh, origin. And that's one of the, the essential concepts in the occult. As above, so below is repeatedly symbolized in esoteric art and a variety of symbols. The most basic of which is a triangle pointing upward or above. This is accompanied by a second triangle pointing downward, below. When combined, they form a hexagram, commonly recognized as the Star of David, one of the most dominant symbols in the occult. Removing the base of the triangles, one can see the outline for the square and compass of Freemasonry. This next image shows what Manley Hall called the God of Reflections. He is called the Ancient One, perched over a pool of water that reflects his image. Notice also how the placement of his arms and the crown upon his head form two triangles like a Star of David, while on his chest is a Maltese cross positioned upward and then reflected again down below. Esoterics believe this same principle of reflection can be found in nature, with bodies of water providing a mirror as a picture of the Hermetic Maxim. With this in mind, consider the placement of the reflecting pools in our nation's capital. Before the Washington Monument, the U.S. Capitol, the Lincoln Memorial, and the Supreme Court. As above, so below is the philosophy that guided ancient cultures into building their cities and sacred monuments in alignment with the stars. While mystical sites like Stonehenge the pyramids, and Easter Island are all examples of this practice. Modern researchers believe that with them is the design for Washington, D.C. As above, so below. All those individuals that were involved in any type of architecture to the ancients that philosophy, that dictum, especially in Freemasonry, was as above, so below. What you have in the heavens should reflect at a certain period of time that which is on the earth. So Washington, D.C., in my opinion, has some very strong, powerful spiritual energies because of the lining up of these buildings to various stars. These spiritual energies are referred to by Masonic author David Ovison. He writes that in the years following the American Revolution, the Masonic fraternities held ceremonial layings for government buildings. Such buildings were aligned with the stars and with the spiritual beings who ruled the stars. The debates over the design for Washington, D.C. usually begin with the designers themselves. Were these the sort of men to employ esoteric philosophy into the building of America's capital city? There's a distinction we have to make between the street plan of Washington, D.C. and the architecture that adorns it. We know the names of the, major, the, the four major people that laid out the street plan and the variations that happen in those street plans. And then there are any number of architects that worked on the various buildings that went up over the years. Nevertheless, at every major level, the influence of Freemasonry is said to have played a pivotal role. So much so that many researchers claim to see a Masonic square and compass in the street design itself. Clearly a lot of the designers and architects of Washington, D.C. were Masons. Um, starting with George Washington himself, who was a high-ranking Mason and who was a leading force and a guiding force for both the location of the city and the layout of the city. 
Washington's authority as the father of a new nation would set the course for America's capital city, beginning with its designer. George Washington was still president during the time that the plan for the city was conceived. Washington had commissioned Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant to work out the initial street design. L'Enfant had come from France with the Marquis de Lafayette and served with Washington during the Revolutionary War as one of his officers. He was known as a temperamental Frenchman, sometimes difficult, if not impossible, to work with. He, uh, as I understand it, felt very strongly about the plan that he developed for the street layout of the city. So much so that when minor changes were suggested, um, he, he became irate. Absolutely the, not. No changes. No changes. But nonetheless, if you look at his original plan, which is, of course, available, you can see maps, uh, his map, of, uh, and it is very similar to the current layout of the city. L'Enfant insisted his original design be followed to the letter something that would later lead to his dismissal from the project. Yet even so, one Masonic author writes that the early architects responsible for individual buildings did attempt with considerable success to honor L'Enfant's master plan. He goes on to call it an arcane schema to be established with the aid of interested Masons. Yet in the planning stages, L'Enfant was particularly at odds with Thomas Jefferson. These guys had a terrible, uh, they, they just did not get along. Jefferson, of course, was a very important part of, of the designing of, of Washington, D.C. Jefferson himself, along with Benjamin Franklin, was said to be deeply involved in astronomy. Jefferson spent five years as the American ambassador to France, when he returned, he brought with him the influence of European architecture. Along with Washington, Jefferson, and L'Enfant was Andrew Ellicott, the surveyor for the city, and Benjamin Banneker, his assistant. Banneker has been called the man who loved the stars. He was a freeborn African American who published a famous almanac on astronomy. His influence on the design of Washington, D.C has been greatly disputed. Some believe that when Pierre L'Enfant was fired from the project, he took his designs with him. Good day, sir. L'Enfant. And that Benjamin Banneker was able to recreate the plan from his photographic memory later on. Others argue that copies of L'Enfant's design were still available and that the unfinished elements were then added by the surveyor, Andrew Ellicott, a little known figure who some believe was a Freemason. While mysteries abound about the specifics, one thing all of the designers and surveyors seemed to have in common was an interest in the esoteric elements that would compose Washington, D.C. Ultimately, when the final design was presented, George Washington chose to call it the L'Enfant Plan. Perhaps the most influential researcher into the L'Enfant Plan and the mysterious arcane elements of Washington, D.C. has been David Ovison, who wrote the book, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital. In his book, Ovison argues that the real mystery of Washington, D.C. is to be found in Federal Triangle. What Ovison felt was that that Federal Triangle was basically reflected from the stars. Ovison's research, more than any other, confirms the idea that Washington, D.C. was built according to hermetic principles, as above, so below. 
as it was laid out to reflect what was going on in the stars, where you had a right-angled triangle surrounding the constellation of Virgo. The right-angled triangle surrounding Virgo is partly reflected in the layout of Federal Triangle and symbolizes the Pythagorean theorem. The theorem simply states that the base of a right triangle squared and the perpendicular side of a right triangle squared are equal to the third side, known as the hypotenuse. This theorem is said to be of unique and mysterious importance in Freemasonry. It's interesting that in the, uh, in the third degree of Masonry, the Master Mason candidate is given several lectures. And one of the lectures he is told to meditate upon the 47th problem of, U of Euclid, which is also the 47th theorem of Pythagoras. And it's also known as the Pythagorean theorem, which is that the, the sum of the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides in a right triangle. And of course, everybody goes, huh? You know, what's that got to do with anything? But it sounds really impressive. And of course, it's never explained. You have to go and look it up. You have to take the initiative and go into a Masonic library or a Scottish Rite library. Fortunately, there was a huge one in Milwaukee where I lived. And then you learn what they're being, what they're being told. What they're being told is that, and again, symbols have different levels of meaning. And um, for example, the upright part of a right triangle symbolizes Baal. The horizontal part of the right triangle symbolizes the female, who is, of course, prostrate and passive. And the hypotenuse, which connects the two, that symbolizes the divine child that, the, that Baal and the goddess create. Baal and Ashtarte, Isis and Osiris, pick the name, they're all the same thing. They're trying to evoke the trinity, the pagan trinity of Baal, or Osiris, and Isis, and Horus. The squared elements of this Pythagorean trinity resemble the letter Y. In his book, David Ovison suggests that Washington, D.C. was intentionally placed at the split of the Potomac and Eastern Rivers to symbolize this Pythagorean Y. It was George Washington who outlined the 10 square mile parameter for the city according to the cardinal directions. But Ovison's principal theory is that in L'Enfant's original plan, the White House, Washington Monument, and Capitol Building were designed in a right triangle according to a star pattern above, where three stars surround the constellation Virgo, forming a stellar triangle. According to Ovison, the federal triangle actually exists within this greater triangle, but with the same purpose. This hermetic symbolism, above and below, is intended to draw upon the spiritual energies associated with Virgo. But for what purpose? Could it be that as Isis brings forth Horus, so the energies of the Virgin are intended to bring forth the Divine Child? Ovison refers to Pennsylvania Avenue as the spiritual center of Washington, D.C., partly because it forms a direct line between the Capitol Building and the White House, but also because Pennsylvania Avenue is the hypotenuse of the Federal Triangle and symbolizes the divine offspring of the Pagan Trinity. The Divine Child is supposed to be the, for lack of a better word, the New Age Messiah. He's supposed to be the product of the coming together of the cosmic feminine forces and the cosmic masculine forces to produce a synergy. This synergy of the masculine and feminine is said to be a key understanding of all occult doctrine. These are the positive and negative, like the black and white imagery of yin and yang. Sir Francis Bacon held to these ideas through the gods Apollo and Athena. Bacon took his mystical views from the teachings of Kabbalah. 
You know, in Kabbalah, it's taught that a man and a woman is a complete vessel. And that's the only way for the holy light to be held entirely. This concept of completion is further defined by the esoteric concept of alchemy. In Arabic, the term for chemistry is alchemia. In the European languages, that becomes alchemy. But it's an Arabic term that simply means the chemistry. Al, the, chemia, chemistry. Alchemy is like divine chemistry. We use that as a term. It's about transformation. It's about transformation of the lower self to the higher self. Some use the symbolic expression of lead to gold. This divine chemistry is sometimes called the chemical marriage or wedding. In the 17th century, the Rosicrucian order put forth a document called the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. A Rosicrucian website explains the purpose of the tale, saying that alchemy is based on the view that man, as a result of the loss of his original Adamic state, is divided within himself. He regains his integral nature only when the two powers are again reconciled with one another. And, and so, just as there was an Adam and Eve, there's a husband and a wife, there's a man and a woman, because it's, it's two different qualities, positive and negative, and together they make the whole. Throughout Washington, D.C., the alchemic and Pythagorean principle of the male and female seems to be repeated again and again. Notice here the James Buchanan Monument, with a male figure to one side and a female to the other. While President Buchanan, who also happened to be a Freemason, is placed in between them, where the perfected man would be. But perhaps the clearest single representation of this Pythagorean alchemical formula is the Boy Scout Memorial found on 15th Street between E Street and Constitution Avenue. The Boy Scouts of America were founded by a Freemason named Daniel Carter Beard. And so it seems only fitting that the Boy Scout Memorial would be a kind of American Trinity where the Boy Scout himself stands in the place of the divine offspring. Yet esoterics argue that this divine offspring cannot come forth without help from above. Primary sources indicate as Jefferson and other all those who were involved with architecture, that you lined up the heavens with whatever you were creating, have it built at a certain time, and that would pour, pull the spiritual energies and, the, and powers into that location. The idea of receiving help from heavenly powers was the ancient practice of alchemists, Rosicrucians, and those in pursuit of secret knowledge. But on Pennsylvania Avenue, the General Gordon Meade statue seems to clearly capture this idea. Meade was the Union General who defeated Robert E. Lee at the famous Battle of Gettysburg, sometimes called the bloodiest and most decisive battle of the Civil War. One that ultimately decided that the American states would remain united. 
noticed the general standing in the forward position with a golden standard of victory above his head. While behind him are a series of mythical god and goddess looking figures as if they might be powers and principalities from the heavenlies. In total, the statue seems to represent the idea that Meade was empowered by heavenly forces to accomplish what he did. But exactly what forces are these? And what power do they represent? A Freemasonic website features General Meade's walking stick with an image of the general carved upon it the name and dates of the Gettysburg Battle, along with a skull and crossbones, while just above it is a Masonic square and compass. Consider also the golden standard that floats like a halo above the general's head, reminiscent of countless images of Christ through the Middle Ages. The theme of a Christ-like figure empowered by heavenly beings has many levels in Washington, D.C. and seems to be the perfect companion to the virgin symbolism which appears throughout the city, not the least of which is the goddess Freedom that sits atop the U.S. Capitol. A replica of Freedom is found inside the Capitol itself. The virgin is said to symbolize purity and perfection and hence becomes the alchemical companion to the perfected man, who also brings forth the divine child. In front of the Supreme Court building are found a male figure to one side and a female to the other. But centered in the tympanum above is not a man, but a woman, said to be the goddess Liberty enthroned. But exactly what Liberty? does she represent? David Ovison's book is subtitled The Masons and the Building of Washington, D.C. Could all of this arcane symbolism have been the intentional working of Freemasons? David Ovison seems to think so. The author declined to be interviewed on camera, but did grant us a phone interview where he told us he felt his lengthy book was merely scratching the surface. We also learned from the Masonic headquarters in Washington, D.C. that since the book's publication, David Ovison has become a Freemason. But while many Masons are proud to say that America's capital is full of Masonic symbolism, not all of them agree. From my studies, uh, of the design of Washington, D.C. and the, its history, I do not believe that there are any secret plans or designs related to Freemasonry. Dr. S. Brent Morris is an honorary 33rd degree Mason and the managing editor for the Scottish Rite Journal, Masonry's premier publication. His office is located inside the Masonic House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. Norman Vincent Peale, Harry Truman, Bob Dole, Gene Autry, John Philip Sousa, John Glenn. We know that he wore this medal. We're not sure that he wore it at the cornerstone. There is the apron that he wore. That apron is still in existence. So, so there he is uh, laying the cornerstone. Now, what makes While Dr. Morris is proud of Masonry's long heritage of prominent members, he disagrees with Ovison's notions of Masonic symbolism in stellar alignments and signs of the Zodiac. Freemasonry uses the Zodiac in only the most superficial way. They use it as an emblem to refer to the heavens. Uh, you can go to the National Academy of Sciences and you can see star maps uh, representing the heavens. Uh, you can see uh, uh, in their mosaic floor, you can see uh, designs of the gods and goddesses. And certainly if anyone in Washington is not influenced by astrology, it would be the National Academy of Sciences. Freemasonry uses the zodiac as a symbol for the sky, as a symbol for the heavens. Uh, we talk about the seven liberal arts and sciences, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, uh, and astronomy. And the zodiac is often used to represent the science of astronomy. 
but there is no special Masonic importance assigned to the zodiac, no uh, Masonic importance at all assigned to astrology. I don't, I don't put much stock in Ovasin's theories. Dr. Morris is a prominent Masonic apologist. He's appeared several times on the History Channel and has written a number of books, including The Complete Idiot's Guide to Freemasonry. I wrote my book, uh, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Freemasonry, because there is a growing interest in the Masonic fraternity. A great deal of this is caused by Dan Brown's recent book, The Da Vinci Code, and the anticipation that his next book is going to be about Freemasonry. Uh, because of this growing public interest, uh, I thought it was important to put a book, uh, simple to read, that was factual and that addressed many of the, the accusations, the claims, the rumors uh, about Freemasonry. Dr. Morris has even lectured at Canonbury Tower in London, the former home of Sir Francis Bacon, who is considered the first Grand Master of modern Masonry. Morris is highly respected by his brother Masons for his diligent defense of the craft. There are many theories out there about the influence of Freemasons on the United States. Uh, you can find websites that, that claim that all the signers of the Declaration or 50 of the signers of the Declaration were Masons and that all or most of the signers of the Constitutions were Masons and that the Great Seal of the United States is a secret Masonic uh, emblem and that the street plan of Washington, D.C. has Masonic emblems. And there are two groups of people that, are, that promote these ideas. The first group of people are the anti-Masons, the people that hate the Masons, that want to show that there is some evil, powerful, possibly demonic conspiracy uh, that is uh, uh, guiding the United States. And the other group of people are the over-eager Freemasons that want to promote the theory. Yet those who oppose Masonry are careful to point out that some of the over-eager Freemasons have been among the most powerful men in America's history. Ed Decker is one of the leading Masonic critics and author of the book, The Dark Side of Freemasonry. Decker warns people about what he feels are the dangers of Masonry. Well, my background in Masonry comes from my family. We've, we've uh, been a Masonic family for as long as I can go back to. I've, I've traced it back to over 200 years of Masonic involvement. Every male member of my family, as well as the women and the kids, and you know, it went down from my you know, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather to my dad. Decker even claims to have been threatened by Masons when exposing their secrets in the past. I've been shot at, beat up, uh, accosted, spit on, uh, you name it, but uh, when they're shooting at you, you know they're serious. I've, my life has been uh, threatened, uh, been shot at a number of times. Uh, praise God I'm alive from that too. Decker believes that Freemasons use clever tactics and word games to cover up their influence in America's history and to hide the truth about their secret rituals. I was on a radio show in, in uh, California one time years back and I was talking about the 30th degree of the Scottish Rite where they drink, they drink wine out of a human skull, the top of a human skull, and they, and they talk about that the, the bread you eat in this Masonic communion is the, is the actual bodies of Zoroaster and Confucius and Jesus and all the great teachers and Buddha and so forth. And that the, that the blood you drink is the blood of, is the actual blood of the combination of all these great, great uh, leaders and great teachers of, of uh, mankind and the great Masons. It's a, it's a form of uh, Masonic transubstantiation. And I was talking about this as a, you know, when you when you go to a ritual and they have you drinking wine out of a skull, you got a problem. And I got a phone call that came in, and the caller said, "I'm a mason. I'm I've been a mason for 60 years, and you're a liar. We don't drink it out of a human skull." And I said, "You're a liar. You do drink it out of a human skull. Don't tell me so. I know. I've been there. I've seen it." And he said, "Well, we drink it out of a plastic skull, not out of a real skull." I said, oh man, you know, it was, a, it was a word game with him. The question has arisen for many. If some of the leading and most powerful men in America's history take part in such occult practices, what will the consequence ultimately be 
for America's destiny. A destiny planned by secret societies, said to be written like so many riddles in the stones of Washington, D.C. A growing number of Masons reject the suggestion of a Masonic agenda in Washington, D.C. Among them is Trevor McEwen, the grand historian for the Masonic Lodge of British Columbia. If you study architecture, you'll note that architects will occasionally play, will play little in-jokes, where, say, in the frieze work around the top of a building, uh, there'll be uh, medallions uh, so that are supposed to be old Roman coins. So what they might do is rather than put a Roman emperor as the face, they'll put their brother-in-law's face there. No one can really see it, but it's there. They'll put their children or their pet dog or across fishing rods because they like to go trout fishing. They'll put little symbols or little ideas hidden in the building just simply because it's their signature work. And they're allowed to do that. No one will really notice. So I'm suggesting that if an architect who happened to be a Freemason stuck uh, a Masonic symbol somewhere, he did that simply as part of his signature, as an expression of his own life, not because some Masonic authority told him to or because it has any Masonic imp impact or, or, or purpose. Well, they can dodge and move around all they want to uh, when you talk to a Mason who says, well, those symbols are just kind of fun things, or they're just accidental, they're not Masonic. That's nonsense. They're put there by Masons for Masonic purpose. Uh, the Masons write about it. They may say that to you at the church when you're talking to them at their church. They may say it to you in the living room when you're talking to the Mason in the living room. But the Masons write about it. You know, in their, in their, uh, in their magazines, they, they do articles about them. And you go on the web and go onto the Masonic uh, websites, and they brag about it. They point to it. One such mason is Michael Bajant, the world-famous author of the book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Bajant is on the board of trustees at Canonbury Tower in London. He is also the editor of the magazine, Freemasonry Today, a publication that openly refers to Washington, D.C. as the Masonic City. Yet among the chief debates is the Masonic membership of its two chief designers, Pierre L'Enfant and Thomas Jefferson. What's interesting when you chase down Thomas Jefferson or someone like Pierre L'Enfant is it's like chasing a, 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 a shadow. Many Masonic lodges and websites openly declare that Thomas Jefferson and Pierre L'Enfant were in fact Freemasons. Jefferson, in particular, is commonly placed in the lists of Masonic presidents, including this collection from the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library. Needless to say, Truman himself was a proud Mason. Some believe that modern Masonry denies the membership of Jefferson and Lyonfont to distance itself from the idea of a Masonic conspiracy in America's history. I mean, I, I can find you it's on the internet, you, uh, oh, there were some Masonic editions of the Bible that list Masonic presidents, and Jefferson is listed. And so they say, aha, we know that Jefferson is a Mason, and you're trying to hide it because he was this awful deist, and you don't want to have a, an atheistic, non-Christian deist as one of your members. And the answer is no. The people that wrote the Bible, that, that wrote the supplementary pages for that edition of the Bible made a mistake. The only way to prove anyone is a Freemason is to have their initiation records. His certainly are missing. Some have argued that Jefferson and L'Enfant might have been initiated into Masonry during their time in France. In Paris, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters was a famous French lodge whose members included Benjamin Franklin, John Paul Jones, and the Marquis de Lafayette. Jefferson and L'Enfant would have certainly been in familiar company. It's possible for Pierre L'Enfant, as well as Thomas Jefferson, to have belonged to a French Masonic Lodge or possibly another Masonic Lodge on the continent of Europe. 
Jefferson was ambassador to, ambassador to France. L'Enfant was himself a, a, a Frenchman. Perhaps they belonged to a French lodge. Uh, perhaps the records were lost uh, during the French Revolution or at some other time. Uh, perhaps they also were visited by space aliens and taken to Area 51 in New Mexico and then flown back to their homes. Uh, that's a possibility also. In stark contrast to Dr. Morris's view, Michael Bajent, in his Freemasonry Today, openly refers to Pierre L'Enfant and Thomas Jefferson as Freemasons, as do many Masonic lodges, even to this day. Similar opposing views also exist on the writings of men like David Ovison. Ovison is not writing an anti-Masonic book. Uh, Ovison, in the main, has good things to say about Masonry. He's talking about how the builders and the founders of this nation were Freemasons. So, of course, that's going to ring sympathetic bells with any other Freemason. Among those whose sympathetic bells seem to have been rung is C. Fred Kleinconnect, the former Sovereign Grand Commander of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, an office believed by many to be the most powerful Masonic office in the United States. KleinConnect is pictured here, next to President Ronald Reagan, when Reagan was made an honorary 33rd degree Mason. This becomes significant when one considers that KleinConnect wrote the foreword to David Ovison's book. He begins with the words, as above, so below, saying, these words attributed to Hermes Trismegistus lie at the heart of the Western esoteric tradition. He later refers to the work as a fascinating and well-researched book. We asked Dr. Morris to comment. Brother KleinConnect uh, was the one who hired me to work at the Supreme Council as the managing editor of the Scottish Rite Journal. I've known him for over 20 years. Uh, I admire him as, as a Mason, as an administrator. I'm quite impressed at what he's accomplished. Uh, we don't happen to see eye to eye on uh, that historical interpretation. But again, I think the important thing is he emphasizes uh, in his uh, introduction or his foreword that Ovason may have found uh, an explanation. He doesn't say it is the explanation. Certainly it's an intriguing explanation, but I don't think that there is any historical basis to it. Of David Ovison's research, C. Fred KleinConnect writes that recent scholarship demonstrates the undeniable influence of Freemasonry exerted on the American system of government. While KleinConnect is careful in his suggestion, he goes on to relate Ovison's work with that of 19th century Masonic icon Albert Pike. Albert Pike is the father, really the father of American Freemasonry. And I don't know of a greater authority on Scottish Rite Masonry than Albert Pike because he authored it. He was the one who wrote a Scottish Rite Masonry, the 32 degrees. Albert Pike, in his ritual research, suggests that the ceiling of Masonic lodges should be painted with uh, uh, symbolic constellations. In the foreword to Ovison's book, KleinConnect comments on Pike's suggestion for a ceiling design. He says, the astonishing thing is that Pike's ceiling design reflects precisely the same mysteries observed by David Ovison in this book. Albert Pike was one of the most prominent 19th century Freemasons. He joined the fraternity, uh, I believe, in 1859, just before the Civil War. He was uh, a scholar of ancient languages, was very familiar with what we would call comparative religion today, and he was given the task by the Supreme Council for the Southern Jurisdiction to uh, rewrite their rituals. And this he did just before the Civil War, uh, and then after the Civil War, he was elected Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction, and he served in that position until his death in, I think, 1891. Pike held the office of Sovereign Grand Commander for the Southern Jurisdiction, which is based in Washington, D.C. This is the same office that would be later held by C. Fred KleinConnect. Albert Pike's great contribution to the Scottish Rite is his book, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. On the title page, it reads, Esoteric Book, 
for Scottish Rite use only, to be returned upon withdrawal or death of recipient. It's given to the new Masons after they've gone through a series of stuff, then they're given a copy of Albert Pike's book. Pike declared that the true definition of Freemasonry is an advance toward the light. The question then becomes, what is the light of Masonry? Many believe the answer comes from Pike's own words. In Morals and Dogma, Pike wrote, Lucifer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not. Masons and their critics will likely agree that these words, perhaps more than any other, continue to haunt Pike's memory. But Albert Pike was not the only Mason to speak of such things. Manley Hall, in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, wrote that when the Mason learns the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. This is another um, bust that was done by Mr. Hall of a man he had a great affinity for, which was Albert Pike, one of the great Freemasons of the world. A statue of Albert Pike is located at 3rd and D Streets in downtown Washington, D.C. It was erected by Freemasons in 1901 through an act of Congress. Pike is shown with a maiden beneath him, bearing the standard of the Scottish Rite. More than a century after his death, Albert Pike continues as an important and controversial figure in America's capital. Not only does his statue remain, but he is the central focus of one of Washington, D.C.'s most unique buildings, the Masonic House of the Temple, the headquarters for the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The building was designed by 20th century architect John Russell Pope, who modeled it after the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Pope himself was not a Freemason, so he relied upon the esoteric knowledge of Elliot Woods, a 32nd degree Mason who was the architect of the United States Capitol at the time. The top of the temple is shaped like a step pyramid that some believe parallels the truncated pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. If you count the courses of masonry on the pyramid, you'll see it has 13 courses of masonry, and that corresponds to the 13 steps on the pyramid that is the roof of the house of the temple. Not only is the number 13 present in the roof design, but the house of the temple is said to be 13 blocks north of the White House leading some to believe that a secret Masonic signature somehow ties Masonry with the seat of power in American government. One of the interesting theories put forward uh, about the layout of Washington, D.C. is that the House of the Temple is exactly 13 blocks north of the White House. And the statement is usually said with a great deal of dread, and I'm sure that if we had a soundtrack accompanying it, there would be uh, deep bass strings playing in the background to, to emphasize that sense of dread. Now, it turns out that there are some side streets at a halfway marker, and if you count them, and you don't count the streets that are in the circles, well, by golly, you can come up with 13 if you kind of squint your eyes and look at it sideways. Using a simple map, 13 individual cross streets can be identified between the White House and the House of the Temple, located on the south side of S Street. Dr. Morris's contention, however, is that if one counts the two streets that cross Scott Circle, rather than only the street that runs between them, it would not amount to 13 blocks. Yet even prominent publications, such as U.S. News and World Report, have written that the Masonic House of the Temple is about 13 blocks north of the White House. But superstition about 13 seems ingrained in American culture. Even our modern elevators specifically avoid the number. 
It said that President Franklin Roosevelt would invite his secretary to dinner to keep from having 13 people at the table and would avoid going out on the 13th of each month. Yet it would seem that FDR was not so troubled about the appearance of 13 on the great seal of the dollar bill. 13 leaves in the olive branches, 13 bars and stripes in the shield, 13 feathers in the tail of the eagle, 13 arrows clutched in its talons, 13 letters in the phrase E Pluribus Unum on the ribbon, 13 stars in the hexagram above the eagle's head, the 13 levels to the pyramid, and 13 letters in the phrase Anuit Coeptus, said to mean God has prospered. When French architect Pierre L'Enfant laid out the design for Washington, D.C., David Ovison tells us he planned for 13 approximate straight lines of avenues for the city. But what does 13 mean in the occult? First, let us consider how those who are involved with mysticism look at numbers. William Wynne Westcott, a well-known Freemason and one of the co-founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, explains that the followers of Pythagoras referred every object, planet, man, idea, and essence to some number or other. The numerals of Pythagoras were hieroglyphic symbols by means whereof he explained all ideas concerning the nature of things. He goes on to say that all systems of religious mysticism are based on numerals. Some believe the phobia about 13 comes from the Last Supper, where supposedly Judas Iscariot was the 13th person to arrive and then later betray Christ. Kabbalists say 13 represents man's ability to go beyond the zodiac, to ascend above the stars of heaven. With this in mind, consider this phrase inside the Library of Congress, to low they build, who build beneath the stars. For Kabbalists, the number 13 is not unlucky, but refers to their concept of God. The word Shekinah represents the manifestation of God's glory. It is taught that the Shekinah glory of God shown in Solomon's temple when it was first dedicated. This picture shows a group of Freemasons reenacting this dedication ceremony. But in the Library of Congress, we are faced with an interesting puzzle. As we find these words painted on the wall, the true Shekinah is man. But what could all this have to do with the number 13? Biblical scholar E.W. Bullinger writes that as to the significance of 13, all are aware that it has come down to us as a number of ill omen. Many superstitions cluster around it. Unfortunately, those who go backwards to find a reason seldom go back far enough. We must go back to the first occurrence of the number 13 in order to discover the key to its significance. It occurs first in Genesis 14.4 where we read that 12 years they served Ketolamer, and the 13th year they rebelled. Hence, it stands in connection with rebellion, apostasy, and revolution. It was when America was made up of 13 colonies that its rebellion against England occurred. Was this just a coincidence, or the intentional working of the Freemasons who launched the Boston Tea Party? An event commemorated here on the ceiling of the Capitol building. Nearby is an illustration which had originally been designed by Benjamin Franklin. Franklin himself was a master mason and the head of several lodges in America and Europe. In his proposal for the Great Seal of the United States, Franklin coined the phrase, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. In this illustration, Franklin chose to represent the early colonies in the form of a serpent, divided into 13 sections, with the words, join or die, in the midst. The traditional belief is that all of that was, was based on, uh, on the fact that there were originally 13 states in the Union, and that the number 13, that's the conventional view, is just, just simply because there were 13 states, that the number 13 was was emphasized. 
Another 13 is found, about 13 blocks south of the Masonic House of the Temple. The cornerstone of the White House was laid on October 13, 1792. The architect for the White House was an Irishman named James Hoban, who took his design from Leinster House in Ireland. Since 1922, Leinster House has been headquarters for the Irish Parliament, but before that was known as the first Masonic Lodge in Ireland. In 1307, the Knights Templar were betrayed in Europe by the Pope and the King of France. By now, it is well known that they fled to Scotland for refuge, hiding themselves in Masonic Lodges. Yet according to 18th century Masonic author Baron Karl von Hunt, certain Templar leaders made their way to Ireland before they reorganized and formed their well-known power base in Scotland. The Knights had a foothold in Ireland since about the 13th century through their banking operations and would have likely gone underground to protect themselves once the persecutions began. What we do know is that centuries passed and in time, Leinster House became the birthplace of Irish Freemasonry with obvious connections to the Knights Templar. Leinster House was once called Kilwinning Lodge No. 75 or the High Knights Templar of Ireland. James Hoban, the architect for the White House, was himself an Irish Freemason. But the White House cornerstone bears a further Templar twist. The Charleston City Gazette reported that the date recorded by the Freemasons for laying the first stone read the 13th day of October 1792, in the 17th year of the independence of the United States of America. It just so happens that October 13, 1792, was the 485th anniversary of Black Friday. Friday the 13th, when the Knights Templar were overthrown in Europe. The numbers 4, 8, and 5 equal 17 for the 17th year of America's independence. Meanwhile, the day before, on October 12th of 1792, was the first celebration of Columbus Day in America and supposedly commemorates how Christopher Columbus sailed for 33 days before he made his first landfall in the New World. A statue honoring Christopher Columbus is found outside Union Station in Washington, D.C. The Columbus Monument declares that it was the faith and courage of Christopher Columbus that gave to mankind a new world. Yet for years, researchers have wondered why American historians have given such credit to Columbus when there were others who had reached the new world earlier. Columbus in 1492 only, only got as far as the Caribbean islands. Even the ceiling of the state capitol acknowledges the coming of the Vikings. Historians argue that Leif Erikson made it to the New World some 500 years before Columbus. You do have history. It's, you just don't recognize it. Or could it be that the recognition is intended to represent something else? After all, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, he did so with sails bearing a red cross on a white background, the symbol of the Knights Templar. These same ships are found painted on the interior ceiling of the U.S. Capitol. When they were arrested, the Templars were accused of devil worship, a charge that has been a point of controversy to this day. Many, many hundreds of knights were captured, they were tortured, and that makes a lot of their confessions rather suspect. However, I think there, you know, the old saying is where there's smoke, there's fire. And it is interesting that in England, the Templar Knights were not tortured. They were interrogated, but they weren't tortured because that was against the law in England. And some things do emerge. One is, is that they do seem to 
have been required as part of their, their ordeal, their initiatic ordeal, if you will, to trample on the cross and spit on the cross. Also, they were alleged to have worshipped this god, Baphomet, and, uh, which is either described as a three-headed deity, or as a skull, or as a goat-headed being. And uh, those things, I think, were probably true. While mysteries abound concerning the relationship of the Templars to masonry, the connection was clearly made by Albert Pike. In front of the Masonic House of the Temple are two 17-ton sphinxes cut from single blocks of stone, one representing wisdom with its eyes half-closed as if in contemplation, while the other represents power with its eyes wide open. These two chief elements are said to represent Plato's ideal balance for the perfected man. The man who has wisdom and the man who has power. To the Scottish Rite, Albert Pike seems to represent such a man as he is a central focus of the temple itself. A bust of Pike is featured at the top of a stone altar in the main hall. Next to it are Pike's own words, what we have done for ourselves alone dies with us, what we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. But exactly what immortal works Pike did for others and the world remains an issue of constant debate among critics of masonry. Albert Pike is a favorite whipping boy of conspiracists. Like the Templars who came before him, Pike's real beliefs are often questioned, and with him, the beliefs of masonry. Albert Pike was a Luciferian, literally Luciferianism is, a, is the, core, the center core of Freemasonry. Pike's body is buried inside the temple itself with this stained glass memoriam next to a bust of his likeness. And they revere him so much that they actually dug him up and buried him, buried him in a wall underground. And you go to the house of the temple and there's a, an actual room dedicated to Albert Pike. The Albert Pike room is located in the lower level and is filled with Pike's many books, a number of portraits and photographs, the Pipes memorabilia, and even the death mask of the man thought by many to be America's most important and notorious Freemason. In his lifetime, Pike would have seen the completion of the U.S. Capitol and the Washington Monument. He lived much of his life in Washington, D.C., and devoted himself to the promotion of Freemasonry. Indeed, some have argued that Pike's controversial form of masonry was the result of a radical struggle that occurred during the years just after the American Revolution. But how did this struggle come about and what was its purpose? More importantly, could this influence have somehow impacted the design for Washington, D.C., and with it, the ultimate destiny of America? The answer to these questions may be found by examining a group that today has much to do with Washington, D.C., one that is thought by some to be the most mysterious and dangerous secret society in the world. General William Huntington Russell was at a university in Germany, studied the ways of a secret society that is sometimes spelled S-C-U-L-L, -L, asked permission to transfer it to North America, and he did. And that is the, the beginning of Skull and Bones. Some 50 years earlier, during the time of the American Revolution, Germany had been the home of a secret order 
that many claim would be responsible for all the wars and conspiracies of the next 200 years. Could William Russell have become involved with a remnant of this German society? He also is on record observing that American Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism had, had drifted from their European origins and roots. And as, as a drift, they were losing sight of the secrets or of you know, the, the, the mandate, the purpose, uh, and the protocols of their existence. So he formed Skull and Bones to reconcile these arcane orders with the mainstream European movement. During this era, the mainstream European movement, especially among secret societies, was on fire with a concept of revolution, which involved overturning old systems of government, monarchies, and the influence of organized religion in particular. In the birth of this revolutionary philosophy, Germany played a key role. In his book, Fire in the Minds of Men, James H. Billington, the Librarian of Congress, writes that the revolutionary ideology of the 18th and 19th centuries was shaped not so much by the rationalism of the French Enlightenment, as is generally believed, but by the occultism and pro-romanticism of Germany. He goes on to say that this ideology continued through the reign of men like Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Billington writes of what he calls the Pythagorean passion of the early revolutionaries, a fascination with the ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras. According to tradition, Pythagoras was driven from Greece to southern Italy where he allegedly founded a religious and philosophical brotherhood to transform society. Pythagorean philosophy dominated the signs and symbols revolutionaries used to define their movement. Billington writes that occultists became politicians and made special use of the two most important Pythagorean geometric symbols, the circle and the triangle, in dramatizing their challenge to establish power. In Germany, the leading revolutionary was a Bavarian law professor named Adam Weishaupt, who founded a secret society called the Illuminati. Billington writes that Weishaupt's final blueprint for politicized Illuminism, written during the first year of the French Revolution, was entitled Pythagoras. Pythagorean geometry plays an important role in the design for Washington, D.C. The entire layout of the city is based around Federal Triangle, a right triangle which represents the Pythagorean theorem. Could this have been the influence of Adam Weishaupt and the revolutionary faith of the Illuminati? And if so, in what other ways could this mysterious and highly controversial group have impacted America? The Illuminati was an organization created in Bavaria. Uh, a Freemason named Adam uh, Weishaupt uh, created the Illuminati as an inner circle of Freemasons. And he was very definitely taken by the uh, period of the Enlightenment. He saw liberal democracy and liberal government, uh, not liberal in the sense that we use it today in political talk, but liberal in the sense of giving rights and freedoms to the citizen as an important way to improve the world. And his plan was to create this inner circle of Masons uh, called the Illuminati, uh, the Illuminati, that means the enlightened ones, and that this inner circle of Freemasons would then spread out among Masonic lodges, and then the Masons in turn would see to it that their members were put in prominent positions in government, and that then the Illuminati's influence would enable the uh, liberal uh, democratic principles of the Enlightenment to be spread throughout the world. It had three ideals. Separation of church and state, controls on the power of the state, and the emancipation of women. Three, uh, three planks in their platform, if you will. Now, one could say 
that the Bavarian Illuminati won because def because that in 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 effect defines western society because the illuminati plan to change the world in many ways came to pass some believe the order functioned through the revolutionary movements of the 18th 19th and 20th centuries the cry for revolution around the world seems to have impacted all the countries of europe and spread beyond to russia china north korea and cuba but most controversial is the society's influence in America, something hinted at in the very date in which the Illuminati in Germany was founded. They, 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 I think they were supposedly formed in 1776, the same year of the Declaration of Independence. And the Illuminati was established as, a, as an organization, you know. He says, no, no longer are we going to take the orders of, of the monarchs in, in 1776. Now that's, that's a pretty important date, isn't it? Now you make reference to 1776 and the Illuminati. Can you draw a line and... I do associate the two because the language was so symbolic. It's too direct and too precise not to know that these people who envisioned such a new world were, were actually combined in the underground secret societies of Europe. Fire was an important symbol to the revolutionaries who were determined to destroy the old world in preparation for the new. As one of them declared, with a match, one does not lift up the world, one burns it. Weissop's Bavarian Illuminati sparked the flame of the revolutionary faith, but some researchers believe that, at some point, their flame was put out. They lasted about 10 years. Now, what lasted for centuries after them was the rumor and reputation that there is a secret inner circle of Freemasons that are plotting to take over the world. Uh, John Robison in Scotland wrote a book, Proofs of a Conspiracy, where he talks about how the Illuminati are trying to take over Masonic Lodges, and Masonic Lodges are trying to take over the world. But the American Lodges, by and large, externally, as we know, did not accept that because it wasn't needed. However, it doesn't mean that there were uh, lodges within the United States that did. You had to have had some Freemasons that were members of the Illuminati, but were they in control of any lodges? Don't think so, because it would be against the law. Uh, in the lower levels, they could talk all they wanted about it, but to get together as a group, as a function, as Freemasons, they couldn't. There was an Illuminati scare. How, how frightening is this? Uh, we've always known there was a Masonic lodge down the street. Could they be infiltrated by the Illuminati? Are they secretly trying to take over our government? Uh, all of this is, is foolishness. The Illuminati went out of business after about 10 years. Uh, they never spread beyond, uh, much beyond Bavaria, certainly never to the United States. It seems logical to some that Weissop's organization was disbanded by 1786 after it had been discovered and outlawed by the Bavarian government the year before. But others point to a letter written by George Washington on October 24th, 1798, 12 years after the Illuminati had supposedly ceased to function. Writing to the Reverend G.W. Schneider, Washington acknowledged the presence of Illuminati doctrines at work in America. The Reverend Schneider had sent Washington a copy of the book, Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe by Professor John Robeson, saying that his book gives a full account of a society of Freemasons that distinguishes itself by the name of Illuminati, whose plan is to overturn all government and all religion. When Washington responded, he said, it was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. We asked Dr. Morris to comment on the letter, but he told us he was unaware of it. 
The letter itself may be found among the George Washington papers at the Library of Congress. In this letter, Washington associates the Illuminati with the Jacobins, the radical French group that launched the French Revolution. Many writers and historians over the last two centuries have concluded that the power behind the Jacobins was in fact the Illuminati. It is well documented that some of the Jacobins came to America and here tried to stir up a second American Revolution through groups known as the Democratic Clubs. The Jacobins, who by this time had overthrown King Louis, sent their ambassador, Edmund Genet, to America to build support for the French Revolution. American leaders like Washington wanted to keep the country neutral, but Genet was determined to bring her into the fray, even if it meant overthrowing the new American government. In a letter from John Adams to Thomas Jefferson, Adams wrote, you certainly never felt the terrorism excited by Genet in 1793, when 10,000 people in the streets of Philadelphia, day after day, threatened to drag Washington out of his house and effect a revolution in the government, or compel it to declare war in favor of the French Revolution. Many researchers believe the French Revolution is the key to understanding the presence of the Illuminati in America. Because the revolution in France had been so reckless and bloody, most of America's leaders were appalled by it, except for one, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson spent five years as the American minister to France and was an ardent supporter of the French Revolution during the planning stages. He even allowed his residence to be used as a meeting place for the rebels, who were led by the Marquis de Lafayette. When Jefferson heard about the bloodshed in France during the Reign of Terror, he said that, rather than see the revolution fail, I would have seen half the earth desolated. Were there but an Adam and Eve left in every country, left free, it would be better than as it now is. Jefferson predicted that the ball of liberty would roll around the globe. The hand rolling this ball would be, undoubtedly, the clenched fist of revolution. For many researchers, the presence of the all-seeing eye floating above an unfinished pyramid stands as clearest proof of the Illuminati at work in America. Is the Illuminati to be defined as Freemasons and Rosicrucians and other uh, secret society members? If that's the case, then yes, I believe the, the symbol on the dollar bill, the truncated pyramid, is directly related to the Illuminati. Dr. James Billington, the Librarian of Congress, is pictured here beside First Lady Laura Bush. His relationship with President Bush is unknown, but we are given cause to wonder at it. According to Dr. Billington, it was the Bavarian Illuminati that put the fire in the minds of men and compelled them toward a global revolution to change the world. Is it possible that this philosophy is at work in America today? By our efforts, we have lit a fire as well, a fire in the minds of men. It warms those who feel its power. It burns those who fight its progress. And one day, this untamed fire of freedom will reach the darkest corners of our world. Could President Bush have been implying what it seems? Is America currently being driven by the same revolutionary fire that inspired the Bavarian Illuminati? Bush is often said to be a fundamentalist Christian but some of his critics claim his views are more ecumenical. As with Freemasonry, Bush believes in other routes to finding God. We all worship the same God, Christian and Muslim. I think we do. Does. We have different routes of getting to the Almighty. Do Christians and non-Christians, do Muslims go to heaven in your mind? Yes, they do. We have different routes of getting there. Is Bush's real belief a clue to understanding his membership in Skull and Bones? And is Skull and Bones, the elite secret society, somehow related to a modern form of the Illuminati? 
The Illuminati was a secret society that existed in Europe, uh, started in 1776. It infiltrated the upper echelons of masonry, and that is how it has managed to exist since that time. A chief piece of evidence is the radical presence of Citizen Genet. Genet is said to be responsible for the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. And George Washington actually sent an army to put down uh, this revolution that was incited by uh, Citizen Genet, uh, who was the French ambassador to the United States, who was a Jacobin. And the Jacobins were simply a front name for the Illuminati. The Illuminati was here. In 1798, the same year George Washington wrote his letter to the Reverend Schneider, another Reverend, Jedediah Morse, gave a speech in which he claimed that the Illuminati had its emissaries at work in America. Morse also associated the Illuminati with the French Jacobins. Among the chief icons of the Jacobins was the red cap worn by the French revolutionaries, known as the Phrygian cap or the cap of liberty. Easily recognized as a cap that, when worn, was often pulled forward, though sometimes to the side. The cap was not only worn by the French rebels, but was often shown symbolically at the end of a staff or upon the head of their goddess of liberty, Marianne, as in this famous painting that glorifies the French Revolution. This same Phrygian cap is found among the great seals of a number of U.S. states, on the official seal of the U.S. Army, and on several figures of liberty inside the Capitol building but its place of greatest prominence seems to be in the Library of Congress, where the Phrygian cap is carved at the top of all the circular window frames and panels in the library. The Phrygian cap dates back to ancient Rome and was said to be worn by slaves who had obtained their freedom and as such became a symbol of liberty. The chief god worshipped at that time was Mithras, who is seen in many images and sculptures wearing this headpiece. Like the gods Baal and the Egyptian Horus, Mithras was a dying god who was later resurrected. In the pantheon of pagan gods, Mithras occupies the place of the Masonic Christ. The Phrygian cap is also associated with the mythical figure of Ganymede, often portrayed as a handsome young man wearing this cap of liberty. Because of his beauty, Ganymede was carried away by Zeus in the form of an eagle and made the cupbearer of the gods. In time, Zeus gave him a place in the heavens where he became the constellation Aquarius. Throughout the 20th century, esoteric teachers have taught that mankind is entering into the Age of Aquarius, also called the New Age. In fact, Freemasonry's premier publication, the Scottish Rite Journal, was once called the New Age Magazine. The Phrygian caps are also seen in this image of the ancient Magi, who followed the star at the birth of Christ. Freemasonry teaches that this is where the Eastern Star gets its name. The, uh, the use of that is actually deceptive because if you think about it, the three wise men were in the east. They were probably Persian. They were looking west and saw the star in Bethlehem. So what that passage means is we have seen his star while we were in the east and looking west. That only makes sense geographically. Nevertheless, esoterics have long believed that the star looked upon by the Magi was in fact Sirius, the blazing star that brings light from the east. It is about a much more ancient connection to the Magi, to, you know, we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts who traveled so far. The, those Magi are Zoroastrian. Yet not everyone accepts that the Magi were originally followers of Zoroaster. Many Bible scholars believe the Magi were Persians, who were influenced by the writings of the Old Testament prophet Daniel, who lived in that region during the time of Nebuchadnezzar the Great. One of the titles given to Daniel was Rab Mag, or Chief of the Magi. In his writings, Daniel was inspired by an angel 
who gave him a timeline in which to expect the Christ of Israel. Many scholars believe the Magi were in fact following the prophecies of Daniel. In contrast, Freemasons believe they were Zoroastrian mystics guided by the star Sirius, and hence Sirius came to represent the Masonic concept of the Christ. This image shows the prophet Zoroaster wearing a Phrygian cap. Yet Zoroaster is most often portrayed with a beard, wearing a robe, belted at the waist, with an eastern head garment. The name Zoroaster is said to mean radiant one and is a reference to the light that shines above his head, said to be the light of Sirius. The dog star Sirius is said to be at least one of the origins of the Masonic pentagram, which leads us by far to the most controversial element in the design for Washington, D.C. There is a pentagram that is produced by the angles of the streets and avenues to the north of the White House. You see the goat of Mindy's appearing, the ears, the, the entire goat of Mindy's and the inverted five-pointed star, which is the goat of Mindy's, built into the streets of Washington, D.C. No one could have that happen accidentally. I've heard sillier things, but not much. No, there are no satanic plans in the street plans of Washington, D.C. The presence of a pentagram in the street layout of Washington, D.C. is said to represent the darkest influence of masonry in America's capital and is the driving force behind images such as this one, which suggests that all the other buildings and monuments are of satanic origin. As many are aware, the presence of the pentagram is greatly disputed. During the Middle Ages, the pentagram was a symbol of good luck and protection when used by those who practiced magic. And one of the things they, they came upon was the idea that if there were such things as, as demons and spirits, then, uh, then they should be able to summon them, either just to observe them to prove that they existed or to control them to whatever purpose they might want to. These people were, I suggest, um, early, an early form of experimental scientists as much as they were magicians. They were just trying to see what would happen. And one of the things they decided to do is if they were going to call up a spirit or a demon in a specific place, they'd draw a circle, and then they would put pentagrams at the corners as a warding sign to protect them from whatever danger that demon might, might pose to them. The inverted pentagram is seen as a highly satanic symbol. Meanwhile, placing a goat's head in the center of it is most often blamed on 19th century French occultist Eliphas Levi. Who arbitrarily decided to say that the pentagram one point up was a positive good luck, good fortune symbol, and one point down was a negative evil symbol. He provided no citations as to where he got that idea from, and there was nothing historically documented prior to him to suggest that anyone ever thought that was the case. This is an important issue because Eliphas Levi was arguably the most influential occultist of the 19th and 20th centuries. He was probably the most powerful sorcerer of the 19th century. His writings inspired every major occult leader, including Madame H.P. Blavatsky, Aleister Crowley, Manley P. Hall, and Albert Pike. Yes, indeed, Pike does quote Levi in his writings. Levi's concept of the pentagram was most likely the influence of the 15th century German alchemist, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. Agrippa is a well-known figure in occult circles and is even mentioned in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as well as J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Agrippa published his books on occult philosophy around 1509. Today, his collection is called The Foundation Book of Western Occultism. 
In this book, he features an inverted pentagram and calls it the Pentagram of Pythagoras. According to Pythagoras, the inverted pentagram symbolized the five chambers of Tartarus, one of the Greek words for hell. But the Pythagoreans believed descending into this underworld led one to a path of higher wisdom. Hence the symbolism of Dante's Inferno, in which Dante descends into hell so that he can later enter into paradise. The Pythagoreans also believed that from this five-chambered Tartarus came the world's demon or evil spirit. The German-based Illuminati, with their Pythagorean passion, would have certainly been familiar with this belief, as would the rest of the revolutionary occultists in France, who could very well have influenced Pierre L'Enfant and Thomas Jefferson. First, we must address the main issue raised by every researcher. Is there really a pentagram in the street layout of the city? One segment of the pentagram is missing. I started to look carefully at the maps and draw my lines, and then I find out that, hey, it's not a real five-pointed star. It doesn't have legs. And you can draw a pentagram over some of the major streets, but the streets don't actually connect to form a pentagram. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that a partial pentagram appears in the street designs of Washington. You can look at a satellite photo of, of Washington, D.C. and see the pentagram. It seems to be symmetric around 16th Street, which is the street that runs into the White House. If you look at the earliest published maps of the District of Columbia, that uh, the design that was laid out by, by Pierre L'Enfant, you can see this partial pentagram. But it is just that, a partial pentagram. Uh, Rhode Island Avenue does not connect all the way through to Connecticut. Uh, I've always wondered to myself if we Masons are so all-fired powerful that we can have this uh, satanic device put in the streets, how come we weren't smart enough or powerful enough to have it completed? But as I understand the use of the pentagram, it's the fact that it is a complete symbol that gives it its power and force. I've never heard of anything being associated with an uncompleted pentagram. These assertions would seem to close the argument, except for the fact that the unfinished or broken pentagram is a recognized symbol in the occult. Manley P. Hall writes of the uses of the pentagram in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. He says, the pentagram is used extensively in black magic. The star may be broken at one point by not permitting the converging lines to touch. It may be inverted by having one point down and two up. When used in black magic, the pentagram is called the sign of the cloven hoof or the footprint of the devil. Of course, Hall wrote these things in the early part of the 20th century. But is there a record of a partial pentagram found during the revolutionary era? The answer is yes. In fact, it is a record that shows up during the same time that the street design for Washington, D.C. was being laid out by Pierre L'Enfant and is mentioned in the play Faust by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Goethe published the first edition of Faust in 1790 in which he mentions a partial pentagram in the dialogue between Faust and Mephistopheles, the devil whom he has conjured. Mephistopheles says, let me go up, I cannot go away, a little hindrance bids me stay. To which Faust replies, the pentagram, that's in your way? You son of hell, explain to me, if that stays you, how came you in today? To which Mephistopheles says, observe it closely, it is not well made. One angle on the outer side of it is just a little open, as you see. While Goethe published his first edition of Faust in 1790, it was between 1791 and 1792 that Pierre L'Enfant drew up the initial street design for Washington, D.C. This might all be seen as a mere coincidence, if not for the fact that Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was not only a master mason, but also a famous member of the Bavarian Illuminati. The Builder Magazine, a Masonic publication, 
in September 1923, said of Goethe that, it is no wonder that German Freemasons point with pride to his connection with their order. After he became a member in 1780, he accomplished no great work which did not ring in Masonic accord. He completed nothing which did not lead back to a Masonic origin. Meanwhile, Masonic author Michael Bajent writes that Goethe not only depicted a Faust figure, he was himself a Faust figure, an adjunct of his own personal hermetic quest. But could Goethe's ideas of hermetic philosophy have influenced the design for Washington, D.C.? And how might an unfinished pentagram reflect the hermetic principle of as above, so below? Which brings us to what may be the most logical explanation for the unfinished pentagram in Washington, D.C., and one that seems to fit perfectly with the rest of the design for the city, a city which David Ovison calls a city of the stars. I have seen it suggested that the unfinished nature of the pentagram in Washington, D.C. bears a resemblance to the unfinished pentagram design that is seen in the motion of Venus. Of course, Venus has a lot of retrograde motion because it is between us and the Sun. And in relation to the other stars, um, Venus, of course, moves around a lot, but it, in effect, draws against the backdrop a nearly complete pentagram. The cycles of Venus rotating around the Sun happen over an eight-year period, during which Venus hits five points in the heavens, which form the outline of a pentagram. The female aspect of Venus is the Celestial Virgin, which David Ovison argues was the chief inspiration for aligning Washington, D.C. with the stars. It would support his theory that there was an intentional astronomical relationship in the layout of the city. In fact, Ovison mentions this motion of Venus relating it to the five-petaled flower, many of which appear throughout Washington, D.C., which represent the path of Venus as shown in this drawing from a well-known book on astronomy from the 18th century. Now, what about the broken pentagram? Most astrologers plot the eight-year course of Venus in relation to the zodiac, and their diagrams look like this. But according to theosophic author David Pratt, this is not entirely correct. He says that while Venus produces a five-pointed star, or pentagram, there is a slight irregularity. For the pentagram is not completely closed, there being a difference of two days at the top, which could mean that the broken pentagram of Venus might look something like this. But which conclusion seems most plausible? Is the pentagram merely an accident? Or does it represent some arcane magical ceremony? Or is it simply a reflection of Venus according to the hermetic principle, as above, so below. With symbols, there are always multiple levels, up to seven different levels of interpretation. One interpretation of the pentagram is given by the Thelemic Order of the Golden Dawn, which says that the pentagram is itself a perfect geometric symbol of the perfected man. Meanwhile, Eliphas Levi writes that the angels aspire to become men for the perfect man, the man-god, is above even angels. Which brings us to the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. The building itself is surrounded by 72 massive columns. The number 72 is said to represent the most arcane figure in numerology. The reasons for this vary. The heart of man beats 72 times per minute. The sun drops back against the zodiac every 72 years. The pyramid on the dollar bill was designed with 72 stones. 
7 plus 2 equals 9, which, in the occult, is the number of finality. And 9 is considered a reverse 6, which is said to be the number of the perfect man. And so it seems no accident that we should find six stars above the head of a figure sitting on a throne overlooking Pennsylvania Avenue, the hypotenuse of Federal Triangle. Beneath him on either side are the figures of a male and a female, with himself in between. Manley Hall wrote about America's assignment with destiny, while FDR spoke of her rendezvous with destiny. Is it any wonder then, that according to the National Archives, the figure on a throne overlooking Pennsylvania Avenue is named Destiny? Could this be a picture of the Masonic Christ? And how might he differ from the Christ of the Bible? But even now, the face of Christ is changing in the world. In New York, at the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine, we find a mysterious image hovering above the altar where a traditional crucifix would be. There are no nails in his hands and no crown of thorns upon his head. Instead, we find a robed figure belted at the waist with a Zoroastrian looking cap upon his head, rays of light shining behind him. Could this be the Christ of the New Age? But even now there are those who believe such a figure is about to take his place on the world stage. In 1982, an English painter named Benjamin Krem took out full-page ads in newspapers around the world declaring the Christ is now here. For more than 20 years now, Krem has traveled the world telling all nations that the Christ, whom he calls Maitreya, is about to appear. Maitreya is standing by, ready to come into the world at any moment. We caught up with Mr. Krem in August of 2006 as he had just come from speaking to an independent group at the United Nations. He had this to say to America. It's the, the duty of the American people to respond to Maitreya and to accept their destiny. It was on May 14, 1982, that Krem held a press conference to announce that the Christ, Maitreya, was ready to emerge. May 14th was also the date of the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. With all the bloodshed and conflict happening in the Middle East, we asked Krem what he thought it might take to bring peace to the region. I've always said it will take my Maitreya to, to solve it. Prophecy teachers warn that the current roadmap to peace followed by President Bush is really a roadmap to Armageddon. Meanwhile, Krem says the solution is the universal Christ, which he claims is awaited by all religions. 2,600 years ago, Gautama Buddha made a prophecy. It's in one of the sutras. Um, that at this time would come into the world another great teacher, a Buddha like himself, by name Maitreya who by dint of his extraordinary spiritual stature would, would galvanize and inspire humanity to create a brilliant golden civilization based, as he put it, on righteousness and truth. Maitreya is the name of Maitreya Putta. All the, all the religions are awaiting him. The Muslims are awaiting a teacher they call, or a prophet they call the Imam Mahdi. The Hindus are awaiting the return of Krishna or Kalki Avatar. Buddhists are awaiting Maitreya Buddha. He is in fact the world teacher for this age, the age of Aquarius, which is beginning now. But how have Krem's teachings been received by Christians? 
who are awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ teaches very clearly, you know. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If we want to try to bring everything together and say, hey, we all worship the same God, well, then we're going to find ourselves offending the one true God. Many of them believe that what I'm talking about is what they call the Antichrist. Some even think I'm the Antichrist. Many of them think, if I'm not the Antichrist, then I'm, I'm the leg man for the Antichrist. Krem is very significant to the New Age movement because he's kind of like the John the Baptist of the New Age movement. He, he, even as John the Baptist was the voice crying in the wilderness that the Messiah had come at Jesus' first coming, uh, Krem believes that he's the one who's heralding his second coming. However, it's a New Age crisis, not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And he comes in a, a way that the, the New Age Christ or the Antichrist is portrayed to come, not the way Jesus Christ is coming. You don't know what the Antichrist is. The Antichrist is not a man. It's an energy. It's an energy, destructive energy, deliberately released to break down the old order. It's in Revelations of, of St. John, if you know. The beast 666, the, name of a man, the number of a man, is the Antichrist, Nero. The Emperor Nero, it was released through the Emperor Nero to bring about the dissolution of the Roman dispensation to prepare the way for Christendom. Oddly enough, Krem's teaching is very similar to a doctrine taught in the Christian community called preterism. Preterism comes from a Latin word that means past. In a nutshell, preterism teaches that the prophecies from the book of Revelation were fulfilled by 70 AD, a teaching many Christians reject. It's really a recipe for apostasy to set up the church for the Antichrist. While many prophecy teachers warn that the coming of an Antichrist is imminent, Benjamin Krem strongly disagrees. It has been, it has gone, it's done its destructive work and made possible for the Christ himself to return to the world. Could Benjamin Krem be right? Were all the prophecies concerning the Antichrist fulfilled in the past? And does the world now stand ready to receive the Masonic Christ of the new Aquarian age? And what can this mean for America? Even now, some believe that America's true destiny is to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Could they be right? Is this the key to understanding the secret architecture of Washington, D.C.? Maitreya himself spoke to me. He said, I myself I'm coming sooner than anyone thinks possible and he will face humanity with a choice create justice in the world and build the most brilliant civilization this earth has ever seen or perish utterly that's the choice